Good evening. Hello, welcome everyone. So, we're going to get started. So, welcome to tonight's Holmes Lecture. My name is Anne and I work in Medical Sciences and we're very excited. We've been asked to do this year's Holmes Lectures. Uh, this is the second of two. Hopefully some of you were around for last week's lecture. Um, so, a couple of housekeeping bits. If you do have mobile phones, can you just put them onto silent, please, so they don't uh, distract? And uh, we're not expecting any fire alarms, but if the bells do ring, then we are going to very calmly uh, exit from the lecture theatre, and there will be stewards directing you to the meeting points, which are just outside. Um, so, I think that's the housekeeping Yes. So this evening's lecture is Seeing Inside the Body with radi uh, Using Radioactivity, and we're pleased to have Gemma and Janice, who will be running tonight's show. Uh, so they are both from, uh, they are, Gemma is a researcher, but she also works in the NHS, in the hospital. Um, it's one of the uh, important things in science. It's really great to find out scientific knowledge and to understand how things work. But one of the really important things is that we then translate that and use it to perhaps uh, improve treatments and help people who are ill and have a real world impact for our research. And that's something that we really focus on here at Newcastle. Um, so Gemma Ian and Janice are from a department called Medical Physics. Now that might not be one of the departments that you've heard of, it certainly wasn't one that I'd heard of before, um, but they do all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, and so tonight we're going to learn a lot more about the work that they do. And there will be some opportunities for you to come down and get involved. And there are some prizes to be won. Okay? Just to, if that encourages anyone. Um, oh, and you should have all been told as you were coming in, if you've got a coin to hand, it's going to be a bit where there's a coin. Okay? And with that, with that we'll hand it to Joe. Thank you very much. Okay, we've got the coins ready, that's not until later. So, so me and Janice, we work in the nuclear medicine department, and what we do is we inject radioactivity into people, and then we use that to, to see what's going inside them using scans. I need some examples that we've got here. And we might be thinking, but is that a good idea? Is not radiation really dangerous? How can we use it inside the body to see what's going on? And that's what we're going to find out about during this talk. Um, so, We've got lots of things that are just naturally radioactive, and so we've got some examples out here in front of us. And so we already want to have these um, two vol uh, three volunteers, please. <laughs> okay, so Anne's going to find three volunteers for us. Okay. So you're going to stand with Anne somewhere else. Okay. So some stuff's naturally radioactive. We've got some examples on the table. We've got some uh, low sodium salt. That's got some potassium that's radioactive in it instead of the sodium. We've got a piece of crockery. We've got your great great granny's necklace. Um, and we've got a banana. Uh, and we've got some glass that glows. Okay, so you guys um, have a look at these. Um, which ones do you think are the most radioactive and which are the least? And I want you to put them in order, so I want you to put the least on this side and I want you to put the most on that side, just, what, just from what you, what you reckon. From the crockery, you don't think that's radioactive? Put that down there. What do you think about the banana? Okay, put that down there, then, yeah. The salt? How radioactive do you think that's going to be? Yeah. Okay. So if you try 
measuring all of them, and then see if you need to change the order that they're in. So what? This is reading out the number of radioactive counts per second. So what is it saying? Six G. Okay. Do we want to put it on? because it's radioactive, but it's only very weakly radioactive. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so the reason that it glows is because it takes um, on the UV radiation that we get just from sunlight. I've got a special UV light here. Um, that goes into it, and then it re-emits that light as visible light, and that's why it glows. Can you see that? There we go. Nice. Okay. So it's not because of the radioactivity. That's just a coincidence. Okay. We've done that bit. <laughs> okay, it's a bit similar to the northern lights in the atmosphere. So those are the like oxygen atoms that are getting excited by the radiation from the sun, and then they're emitting that light in the visible wavelength. These are some photos I took last year in Finland when I went to see the northern lights. Okay, so why were we not worried about having you come and look at these radioactive <coughs> items and touch them? Um, it's because radiation's all around us, radiation's everywhere, just naturally. So you can see on this graph here, we get lots of radiation from space, the cosmic radiation, that's why you get a dose when you go in a plane. Um, we get radiation from the ground in the form of radon gas that comes up through the ground. Um, we get it from our food, we get it from rocks, and then we get some from medical exposures, like the ones that we do in the department that we're going to talk about today. So now we're all going to play a game that we can do together. This is higher or lower. It's a bit like playing cards right for the, for the people that remember playing cards right. <laughs> so we're going to do a scenario that gives a radiation dose. We've got to say if the next one, you think it gives a higher or a lower radiation dose. So we'll give you an example now. Okay, so with the banana. We did the banana before. Okay. And the next one is Brazil nuts. So higher or lower for the Brazil nuts. We'll shout out together. Lower, 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 okay. All right, so the Brazil nuts. The Brazil nuts are much, much higher than the banana. About a hundred times higher. But listen, shh, but they're both still much below the dose you would get from a day from normal radiation. So that, so they don't give you much of a dose. Next one. Okay, so my mum really likes Brazil nuts, she likes chocolate Brazil nuts at Christmas. If she eats all these Brazil nuts, do you think she gets um, more or less dose than though she had a dental x-ray? So we're going to ask you, is the dental x-ray higher or lower than the Brazil nuts? Higher! 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 Most people are saying higher. It's actually lower. <laughs> what about... If she goes on a flight to America. Higher. Higher? Yeah, you're right. Well done, higher. 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 Okay. So going to America. 
therapy will give you about twice the radiation doses eating all of those Brazil nuts. It's about the same dose um, as going to like Lanzarote or something. Okay. So how does how does the X-ray work to get to get this chest X-ray like this? So what we do is we've got an X-ray machine that's producing the X-rays. We fire them through the patient's body at the back as a detector, and then on the screen the um, dark bits are the dense bits of the body, and um, sorry the other way around. The white bits are the dense bit of the body, and then the, the dark bits in the middle like in the lungs there. Those are the less dense, so those are where the, the X-rays can go through, and that's how you get an X-ray. So the next one, a chest X-ray. And a trip to Cornwall. Do you think the trip to Cornwall is going to give you a higher radiation dose or a lower radiation dose? Higher. Okay. I think most people are saying lower. So it's actually a lot higher. And that's because down in Cornwall they've got a lot of radiation coming from radon gas that's coming from the ground. Luckily, we're okay up here. We haven't got a lot of this dose. Um, so if you go to Cornwall, you get a lot more than your normal background dose. Um, but we don't worry about people that are living in Cornwall. They're all fine. So this is showing us that even when you get a radiation dose at these low levels, um, it can be, it can, you can get 10 times as much. It doesn't make any difference to your health. Okay, so we're going up a bit now. Um, what about the dose that the people that were helping with the nuclear emergency at Fukushima what they got compared to what you would get if you went on a trip to Mars. So with Mars, is Mars higher or lower? Alright. Okay. So the trip to Mars is a bit higher. You get about twice the radiation. And these radiation doses are quite high, about a thousand times what you would get in a year naturally. But even though these are really high, they're still not, not high enough to cause any damage like radiation sickness, like what people associate with radiation. So you have to get quite high radiation doses before you get um, anything like burns or radiation sickness. But radiation is really dangerous in these high quantities, and we know. Um, for example, this is the Russian spy uh, Litvinenko, and he was poisoned with a radioactive isotope, polonium, um, and that went inside him and gave him a really big radiation dose and killed him. So we know that it's dangerous in these high doses. In medium doses, what we're worried about is the radiation damaging your DNA, um, so maybe causing cancer. And then at the low doses that we use in medical imaging, there's no evidence that the radiation is actually harmful but we can't prove that it isn't. So we always have to assume that there might be a very small risk when we have a medical exposure. That's why there's lots of controls around it. Okay, so how well do you know your five a day? We're going to show you now an x-ray of some fruit and veg. All right, let me check it out. This is the second about it. Okay, ready? So, the first one, A, what do you think that is? Lemon, lemon, lemon orange, okay. Next one? Yeah, well done. Next one? Yeah, nice. Oh, yeah, I have peach, good, good. Nice. And this one? Yeah. I thought you might say that. Any other that's just for cheese? Tomato? Okay, so, listen, so this is only one way to look with x-rays at stuff, this is just from one direction, we can also look from three directions, that's called computed tomography or a CT scan, if you've heard of a CT scan, so the x-ray set is going around the patient, so we're creating slices through the patient, you can see that, you can see the lungs, and you're going to see the liver there, going through, down, down the person, okay, so we've done this for the fruit as well in the department, so that, was, that was the x-ray, and then this is the CT scan. So this is looking at the same direction as before, so from, from the top. Can you see we're going to the pear at the top there? There's a the carrot coming there. I like the onion there. Okay. And then the one we weren't sure about was the bottom right. And we're still not really sure from that image, are we? So we're going to look from the other direction now. Oh, gone for it. Come on. <laughs> here we go, here we go. Right, so we've gone through what, this one. What do you think that one was? The orange lemony one, so you can see it's a satsuma, isn't it? Okay. But, um, I think we've gone, we've gone past. This is the 
interested. Yeah. So we've gone past the one that was interested. We'll loop round. That was the pair. We just saw the pair there. Wait for the one on the right here. Here it comes, here it comes. An apple! Okay, so that was the apple. Right. Okay, so last week, if you remember, we had the horrible histories of dentistry, if you were here, and now we're going to have the horrible histories of radiation and radioactivity. Okay, so um, we'll start with the next rays. So x rays were discovered by accident, and that was in um, 1895. That was in Germany by a scientist called Brinken. Um, and they were like, well, this is a wonderful new ray, it can see through the hand. He took a picture of his wife, who was just a bit of a guinea pig. And then you can see these guys, though, on the right here, they're, just, they're with, playing with the x-rays, showing that they can go through the hand. But they're not looking at any kind of radiation protection, or they're, they're just going for it. The guy at the top's looking on a fluorescent screen, so we can see his hand moving in front of him, with the bones of his hand. And then the guy at the bottom has got his hand on a photographic plate, so he's making an image. Okay. So in radioactivity, that was just discovered the year after. That was um, in France, in Paris, by Henri Becquerel. Um, and he was really interested in things that glowed. So he was interested in like, the uranium that we were looking at before. So he liked, yeah, he liked shiny things. Um, so this was, again, a discovery that was made by accident. So he put the uranium in a drawer where there wasn't any light. And it still turned out that you could see it on the photographic plate but there wasn't any light to expose the plate. So he worked out that it must be emitting some kind of radiation of its own all by itself. So yeah, it's, em it's emitting these rays, but nobody knows what they are. They're called Becquerel rays for a while. So he didn't know what was causing this or what they were. Um, then along came Marie Slodowska Cooley. So she was Polish, she was Maria Slodowska. She came to Paris and married Pierre Cooley. Um, and then they were really into this. They looked into this in great depth and they found out that you could extract different radioactive elements from the substance they were looking at, it's called pitch blend. So they managed to isolate radium and polonium. They, they named polonium after, her, after Poland, she came from Poland. Um, okay. so that's her and Pierre there on the honeymoon, a bit different from honeymoon today. Um, so Pierre wasn't too lucky in the work, he got some radiation burns, um, and then um, he didn't get to carry on for very long because he got run over by a, a horse and car. Um, so before that, they, they were, all three of them they were awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering radioactivity. But yeah, soon after he died, and, and then Marie carried on all by herself, and she got another Nobel Prize for extracting the radium. Okay. Um, but she didn't manage to stay safe from the radiation um, that much longer. Eventually, she did die from radiation sickness from all the experiments that she was doing with her, her radium and her polonium. Um, and her polonium is still radioactive even now because the half life of radium 226 is um, 1,600 years. So it takes 1,600 years for it to go down just by half. Um, so she's been buried in a lead lined coffin. That's, that's one of her radioactive books. Okay, so then along <coughs> came Ernest Rutherford. He was a bit like the Sheldon Cooper of his day, like a hundred years ago. He thought all science would be stupid if it wasn't physics. He only liked physics. Um, so he was really smart. He was the one that discovered from all this radiation coming out from the, these rocks, he discovered it came in three different flavors. Um, so it comes in alpha, beta, and gamma. And they're all quite different from each other. So um, if an atom decays and emits an alpha particle, it becomes a different kind of element entirely. So it gives off this alpha radiation. And the alpha particles are positively charged. So you can deflect them with a magnet. So he, he worked out that they must be particles and they must be and they must be heavy and they must be charged. The other kind is a beta decay. That's when the nucleus gives off um, an electron. The electron doesn't come from the electrons around the end, it comes from in the nucleus and it gives it off to get rid of some energy. Because these nuclei that are radioactive, they're all they've all got too much energy, they want to get rid of energy and they want to they want to go down and become more stable. So this also changes the element into a different kind of element. So both alpha decay and beta decay change one element to another. The next kind is gamma decay. Now in gamma decay, the element doesn't change from one type to another, it stays the same. It's just kind of rearranging itself to get into a more stable state, and it's getting rid of all the excess energy by firing off really intense gamma rays. Those are the same as light, but much more high frequency, so it's similar to X-rays. Does anybody know what the difference between X-rays and gamma rays? Yeah, what do you think? Do um, gamma rays like pass through lots of things? 
Yeah, they can. They can. The X-rays can as well. Yeah, that's why we can do the, the X-ray. Um, so the answer is that they're both the same and they're both different. So they're the same because they're both high frequency light. You can't tell the difference between them. But we call them gamma rays when they come from the nucleus. We call them X-rays when we make them in a the machine. So it's just like we're calling them different things, but they are the same form of radiation. Okay. Next. Okay. So at the time of Rutherford, when he was doing all these experiments, everybody thought that the atom was like a big positively charged thing with some negatively charged things studied in it, and they called that the plum pudding model, because it was a bit like a Christmas pudding type thing here, and the electrons were like the plums that were just throughout the whole of the, the model. So Rutherford showed that that was completely untrue, and actually the atom is mostly big in space. The nucleus is really, really small in the middle. That's positively charged. Then there's negative charge around the edge. But mostly it's open space. And he proves that by firing alpha particles through some gold foil. And most of them go straight through, and you see. And that shows that most of the atom is empty. But some of them bounce off, and those are the ones that have hit the nucleus. And then they come back, or they get deflected. So this experiment showed that that model before, of the atom just being a big lump, was completely wrong. And actually, most most matter is just empty space. Okay. So this is the sort of thing that we often look at when we're looking at what does, what does an atom look like. It's difficult to imagine. But this is also completely wrong as well. Um, but it's still used nowadays, so, so even the Institute of Physics, they still use it in their logo. <laughs> Actually, we want to think more like this. So we've got a nucleus in the middle, which is very small, and then around the edge, even tiny and smaller probability density of electrons. We don't know where these electrons are. We just know that we have the, like, the probability that they might be somewhere. We can't tell exactly where they are, just like a hole around the edge. So, does, do, you, do you guys know where this is? Yes, James's. Okay. So, if, a, if an atom was as big as James's, how big do you think that the nucleus in the middle would be? So, we've asked you already. Asked you already. But the back part is striking up. Shout out. Piece of sand? That's a good guess. Okay, anyone else? Oh, orange? Maybe a football. Football, good guess again. Okay, um, I've got several people with their hands up in the back there. Why don't you just shout out? Side of the pitch. Side of the pitch, that's what you said. <laughs> that's that's amazing. Amazing. So, yeah. <laughs> right, so. Just about time. Okay, at the end here? The side of the tennis ball. That's a really good guess. That's the closest so far, I think. At the back? Marble. Marble, very good guess. The this one there? Size of, you know that white thing at the bottom? Like the thing that you put the ball in. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. yeah. Smaller than that. So the answer is, is that the size of a golf ball, roughly? Oh, well done. Nice. <laughs> okay. So if the nucleus is the size of a golf ball, roughly how, um, how what, sort of, what sort of, what particle could be used to model the electrons around the edge of the stadium? What do you think to represent electrons? You have to ask you, have to ask you, have to you. You haven't, what do you think, Lennon Stepper? Right? Marbles? Okay, no, smaller than that, smaller than marbles. The boy there with the oh, sorry pins pins are really good actually yeah and um, right at the back there uh, really good yeah dust particles okay so so much so much smaller than the nucleus okay right so back in this time we looked at it again everybody went crazy about radium and radioactivity they thought it was amazing and they thought it was really good for you so they were doing things like putting it in butter um, <laughs> putting it in water. They used it in makeup. They just thought it would give you kind of this like life affirming power. Okay, but now we know obviously that that's not good. Um, so, um, if you guys were around 100 years ago, you might have just got for Christmas. You might have got one of these glow in the dark watches. So, so yeah, splendid Christmas present for boy or girl. Um, and they they glow in the dark because they've been painted with radium paint. Okay, and um, so they had these big factories um, in America where the women would paint. Um, and it had to be very fine work. So what they had to do is they got the, the brush and they put it in their mouth to make it really fine so they could get the numbers right. And then obviously then they were eating some of the radioactive paint. Um, and eventually the, this paint went into their bones and it caused them, their bones to be really brittle and to break and some of them it caused them to get cancer. And, so, and the reason that happened is because they were using um, a radium a radium and um, they were using radioactive radium. And in the periodic table, that's in the same group here as calcium. 
So it's got the same kind of um, chemical properties. And do you know what calcium it likes to go to? Yeah? Do you know? Do you know, what, does, what does calcium like to do? You go to your bones, yeah. So, cal so your bones really want calcium. So because radium is similar, they also really want the radium. So all this radium that they were eating was going into their bones, and then it was irradiating the bones and damaging them. So there's a really sad story there. Um, then we move on to the first use of radioactive tracers. So a radioactive tracer is a small amount of radioactivity that you can put in something to see what's happening. So in, in nuclear medicine, we put it into people's bodies to see what's happening. But it's a bit different with this story here, as you can just see. So this guy worked with Ennis Rutherford in Manchester. Um, when he was a lot younger than in this photo, he was living in like, some student accommodation with a landlady. Um, and he was very suspicious that he was being like, refed leftover meals, like recycled into new, into new meals. So what he did was he got some radioactivity from the lab, obviously, <laughs> put it in the pie, um, and then he waited to see whether the, the food came back radioactive afterwards. And then on Wednesday, it came back radioactive, so he proved that she was recycling the food. He says, this coming Sunday, in an unguarded moment, I added some radioactive deposits to the freshly prepared pie. And on the following Wednesday, with the aid of an electroscope, I demonstrated to the lady the presence of the activity in the souffle. <laughs> <laughs> so, we might think that's a crazy thing to do, but we actually do something quite similar nowadays in the, in the department. We give people radioactive scrambled eggs, and we want to see what's happening inside the tummy and what's happening to the food. So we look, um, we take a photo of the, of the radioactive scrambled eggs with a camera, a special camera, and then we look to see whether it's moving out the stomach. So the stomach has been drawn around in red, and you can see on this example it's going out of the stomach, so that's good. So, that's the, so the food is moving out, it's moving into the intestines, you can see at the bottom. This example here, can you see that nothing's really happening, the food's just staying in the stomach, and that's not great. You can get lots of vomiting and symptoms from that. So with this test, we can show that that's happening. Okay, so to look at that stomach activity, we use a, a machine called a gamma camera. So it looks at gamma rays, so we call it a gamma camera. Okay, and this is the first one, um, really small. And then now we've got these really big ones, so we can look at whole organs at the same time. So the, det the detector's on the top of this man here. There's another one underneath. Okay, so this is what our one looks like over at the RBI, over at the hospital over the road. So it's got the gamma camera, two detectors there. It's got a couch that you put the patient on. And then um, this is what it looks like if you take it apart. It's got lots of little mini detectors in it that tell us where the gamma rays have come from. And this is the simulation of how it works. So we inject the person with a radioactive tracer. That's happening there. Then the gamma rays cut off. <coughs> then they go through a lead collimator, a lead grid. They cause a flash of light to happen inside the detector. And then those tubes that you saw before, those tubes detect the flash of light and it can tell where the gamma rays come from. So we do that lots and lots of time, times um, and it builds on a picture. So you can do the bottom, it builds on a picture of the radiation that's gone to the bones. So that's a bone scan. So for a bone scan, this is what we do. So we first we inject the tracer, um, and it's a type of tracer that, that wants to go to the bones. Then we have to wait for a bit so we can get, have a chance to get to the bones. And then we put the patient on the scanner and we move the camera gradually over their whole body. It takes about 20 minutes to get a picture of how active their bones are, so where their bones are trying to repair themselves. Okay, so we've got two bone scans up here. So can you tell me, do you think that the one on the left, do you think it's normal or abnormal to the A? What do you reckon? On the back there? Abnormal, okay. Why do you think that? that's a normal one and that's just normal uptake that we see because you've got quite big bits of bone in your shoulder there and in the pelvis as well you've got really big thick bits of bone so that's normal in the middle the second in the middle of the pelvis oh, yeah. the bladder very good that's <laughs> so we ask people to empty their bladder to go to the toilet before the scan so we don't want this big circle in the middle but they've done a very good job we've done a good job on that one it was me <laughs> so the next one the B do you think that's normal or abnormal Abnormal here. What do you reckon of that? Abnormal at the back? The skull doesn't have much in it, so I think it's abnormal. I think we've just not caught the top of the skull. You say you think it's normal, abnormal. Abnormal, okay. So that one's normal as well. Um, and that is the scan of a teenager. And do you know how we can tell it's a teenager? What do you reckon? Yeah. Um, not just because of that. What, what about the back in the knees? Where, and the, 
and the feet there. Can you see anything? Oh, they're more white. Yeah. Okay, why do you think they're white? Now this guy here, what do you think? Growth plates, brilliant, well done. Yeah, so we can see the growth plates because this, the teenage is still growing, the bone is still adding on to it, so we can see the growth plates, brilliant, okay. And um, we'll go backwards. Right, so a bone scan is really different to an x-ray. So an x-ray, we, 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 can, we can see exactly what the bones look like. But the, this nuclear medicine bone scan, we're seeing how the bones are functioning, we're seeing what they're doing. So the two kind of complement each other. Um, so our gamma cam that we've got over at the RBI has also got a CT scanner at the back. So do you remember we saw the CT before? So we can do both types of scan. We can do the bone scan, and then we can also do the CT scan at the same time. So this is a bone scan example. And you can see there's, there's, where the arrow is, there's a, there's a darker bit, there's a dark area, and it's fine. So the doctors are wondering why. So we can do a 3D uh, nuclear medicine scan at the top, then we can also do the CT scan, and we can put them together. So we can see that this is caused by osteoporosis. So that's, you can see it's all white on the x-ray, and it's really hot on the nuclear medicine scan. Okay, so um, which radioactive um, element or isotope do we use for our scanning? That's the next uh, section. Okay, so we use this one here. You, you might not have heard of it. It's in the middle of the periodic table. It's a metal. It's called technetium. The way that we get it is from another element that's next door, and that's called molybdenum. Okay. So, the molybdenum is radioactive. Um, it gives out a beta particle, so it gives out an, an electron. That changes it into technetium. And then the technetium is also radioactive, but it, it gives out gamma rays. See? There we go. <laughs> gives out a gamma ray. So, um, so the molybdenum, we can't use that for, for our medical imaging because the, the electrons, the beta particles, are no good because they get stopped by the body. You can see on the table here, get stopped by a few millimetres of aluminium. So also all your big body, that will stop it as well. You can't use that for imaging. The gamma ray is much better. We can use that for imaging because it gets out of the body, gets into the detector so you can see where it's come from. Okay. So now, this is the bit where we've got the coins. Okay, so you get your coins. Now I want you to all stand up and pretend that you're a radioactive nuclei. Okay. each time. So the first throw, we all went down by half. The second throw, the half that were left went down by half, so we went down to a quarter. The next time, the quarter that were left went down by half, so we went to an eighth. And that's like radioactivity, that's how it works. It goes, it falls off really quickly, and then it starts to tail off. So that's what we've got here. So for our technetium 99M that we use um, to inject people with in nuclear medicine, um, it's got a half-life of six hours. So that means that every six hours, it goes down by a half. So after six hours, half of it's gone. 
then after another six hours, so after 12 hours, we've only got a quarter left. So that's how it works. It keeps going down by a half. So can you work out from that information what would be left after a day, after 24 hours, if you can work it out? Okay, I'll just give you a minute. Okay, are ready? Okay, we've got an answer over there, back there. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Well done, nice one. Okay. <laughs> so, so we've only got, yeah, 16th, well done. Okay, 16th is the right answer. So after a day, it's gone down to only a 16th of what it was. And so why is this a good thing? Why do we want it to go down? Why do we want it? Because it would stay in your body the more, the more radioactive it would get if you had like a scan in the future or something. Yeah, it's, it's because we don't want the patients to stay radioactive forever. We only want them to be radioactive when they come for the test. We don't need them to be radioactive after that. So it's good that it goes down. But we also, we want them to stay radioactive when we inject it for long enough to do the scan. So this six hours is pretty good because it's long enough so it stays in there for the test, but then it goes away after a day or two. So it's really good, six hours. The other thing that's really good is it gives out this gamma ray. And it's the right energy for our detectors to image. Oh, don't love it. Okay, ah. <laughs> so a single atom is completely random when it's going to decay. So we never really know. It could be right now or it could be in years. But when we've got lots and lots together, statistically, we know on average how, how long it's going to take for the material to go down. So, so if you've got an injection, we've got about a trillion radioactive atoms inside an injection that we're putting into someone. So it's so many that we can be very, very sure that it's going to go down by half in six hours and then go down again by half after another six hours. Okay, so how do we make these radioactive chasers? So the molybdenum, do you remember the molybdenum? That comes from a nuclear reactor. So what happens is we fire neutrons, well I don't do it, but people fire neutrons at uranium, then the uranium it breaks up nuclear fission, it breaks up into the molybdenum and then other nuclei. Um, so we get it from a nuclear reactor. Um, but we don't have one in the UK, so we have to get one, get it sent over. So this uh, molybdenum that we get sent over, so that's radioactive, but it's got a longer <coughs> half-life than technetium. It's got a half-life of about 66 hours. So we still have to get it replaced every week. But we, um, but we, um, but it, it's enough time that we can use it to make the, te the technetium. Okay, so it, it gets delivered in this lead-lined container called a generator. So all the molybdenum is inside there, and that's decaying with its half-life of 66 hours into technetium. And what we do to get the technetium out is we get some salt water, and we put the salt water through, and then it goes out the top. Okay, and it gets attached to the salt water. So on the top, we've got the technetium attached to the salt water. That's how we get it. And then what we want to do is use chemical reactions to attach it to different kinds of drugs that we're going to inject into the body. So the technetium is the bit that gives off the gamma ray, but the drug bit is it goes to different bits of the body so we can see how it's working. So that's what we do. And so we have to do this in the radio pharmacy. So this is our radio pharmacy here. Okay. Um, we have to put all these clothes on, these special clothes. We've got some examples here. Um, why do you think we've got to put these special clothes on? You've answered a lot there, you've answered a lot. Uh, what about the girl in the blue jumper there? From the radiation? Yeah, that's a good guess. That's not the main reason we do it though. What, do you think there's any other reason that you hear? That's another good reason, but it's not the main reason. I think maybe Janice can explain the main reason. Well, we're Have we got another person over here? Yeah, when you want to guess? Yeah, so we all think it's something yeah. to do with the radiation, don't we? Exactly. So we, as humans, we're always shedding skin particles and we're not always that clean. We, we try to be clean, but we can never be completely sterile and clean. So we're actually protecting the drugs that we're making from us. So it's, it's not protecting us. Okay, so Janice is going to give us a little demonstration now about what it's like to make some radioactive traces in the lab. Not really, because I never thought about bringing, I should have brought more things, but what I'm going to do is <laughs> pretend we've already made it, we've got it made up, and we're going to do a little race and get two people up to don the clothing and then draw up a syringe. A the demonstration of one, okay. so you can stop yourselves. You're going to get to fill a syringe with no bubbles in it, and I will judge who does it the fastest, but also who does it the best, 
with no bubbles in the syringe. Like that.
That's it. Now you need to turn it upside down. Okay, let me go. So take the cap off the syringe. expensive outfits so we can't let you keep them as souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> come um, up and they'll be very breathless um, so they won't be able to breathe properly um, so what we do first is we check using an x-ray if, if that's due to a different reason not not due to a blood clot it might be due to infection like there's an infection in that lung there can you see where it's gone white um, the other thing that's an option that we could do is could look at the blood vessels to see whether there's a clot with a ct scan so you can see they're all really dark there that's because we're using what's called a contrast agent that's some iodine that's very dense you can, you can see it on the, on the ct scan um, but this gives you quite a high radiation dose and also you're not looking at the function of the lung you're just looking at the vessels so what we do instead in nuclear medicine is we get the people to breathe a radioactive gas so that's on the left hand side there you can see the lungs then on the right hand side we inject them with a radioactive tracer that goes into the lungs with the blood so wherever the blood can go in the lungs the tracer goes and if there's anywhere where the blood has been blocked because of the clot then the tracer can't get there. And you can see on this picture, there's some light areas. Can you see these light areas? Those are caused by the blood clots, so that we can diagnose the pulmonary embolism with this scan. Oops. Okay. Next rip. <laughs> okay, so we've got... What do you think this is? The heart. Yeah, the heart. Okay, lovely. We can look at the, the arteries that go to the heart, so where the blood flows to the heart. They sometimes get blocked by coronary artery disease from plaques. The blood can't flow as well. So we inject a tracer. Um, well, sorry, the first thing we could do is we could do this, this x-ray, this x-ray video called a fluoroscopy, where we inject a contrast agent, the iodine again, to look at the vessels. The problem with this is, because we're doing lots and lots and lots of x-rays in real time, it's quite a high radiation dose. You also have to put the patient under anaesthetic, because obviously it's not very nice, is it? Um, so there's the risk of anaesthetic as well, it's quite invasive. So what we do 
in nuclear medicine instead is um, we do a scan of the heart. So we inject a tracer that goes to the heart if the blood vessels are working properly. Um, so this is what we do then. We have to process the image and we look at slices through the heart in different directions. And it should all be nice and orange if the blood is getting to the heart. If it's not, then we get this kind of um, sort of pattern where it's, um, there's bits of the heart that are missing because the blood can't get there. Okay, another example of this. Can you see? Kidneys, yeah, okay. So we've got the kidney here. We're looking at the drainage of the kidney, so the urine going into the bladder. So we've got two <coughs> kidneys at the top here and then the bladder at the bottom. And you can see through the video that the activity goes out from the kidneys and into the bladder. The one on the right-hand side, you see the kidney start to drain. But this kidney on the right, the activity is staying in there. It's trapped in there because there's a blockage. It's not going down. And we can draw around the kidneys. Um, on the images to see and draw a plot, draw a graph. So on this graph here, um, the left kidney, which is working properly, that's in blue. So you can see that the amount of tracer goes up and then it goes down nicely as it drains. The other kidney, which is in, in uh, green, that kidney, it doesn't go back down because um, the tracer is not draining out of the kidney, so it's showing that it's blocked. Okay. So that's all the scans that we're going to talk to you about. So thank you very much for listening. And Oh, thank you. <laughs>
So I guess about 25 years ago when I was your age, I was, I was really fascinated um, great by um, astronomy and what was going on in the middle of stars. They call that nuclear astrophysics. I was really interested in, in stars. So that's how I got into physics. I wanted to do astrophysics. Um, but then at university, I was more interested in the nuclear side. So then afterwards, I went into the medical physics that way. Uh, does all of the things you told us apply to other animals as well? Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, so yes, um, so the, the same effects ha um, do apply to other animals, and a lot of the research that we, how we know what happens with radiation is from animals, so from people studying animals. Um, yeah, so it does. But the the thing that we're worried about with the, with the, these scans, um, well not with these scans, but with low doses of radiation, is the possibility of getting cancer. And the problem with the animal models is that animals they often don't live long enough because it takes a long time for the DNA mutations to take to have effect. So the animal models are not that good for studying that. But yeah, really interesting question. Thank you. When, when, <coughs> when was the first uh, CT scan made? Oh, <coughs> that's asking me now. I, I, I think it was like in the 60s, 70s, but I don't know that for sure. I can't, I'm not going to lie to you. It was around the same time as the gamma cameras, I think. Um, I'm sort of a three-part question. But... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, is the, what is the deadliest element, element in your opinion? What is what, sorry? The deadliest element. The deadliest element. Oh, we're probably going to go for polonium. That's what, uh, polonium-210, that's what the engine was poisoned with. It gives out alpha rays. Alpha, alpha radiation is really bad if you swallow it because it's really damaging to the body. So radium also, we've, we've heard about the radium girls as well. That's also alpha emitter. Anything that emits alphas, if you if you eat it, then it does you damage. What's the next part? <laughs> <laughs> what what would you say is more deadly, the Fukushima disaster or Chernobyl? Um, Chernobyl was for sure. <laughs> and what's the most deadly animal that you test people on? It's all about death. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? What's the most deadly what? Element. element that we use? We well, none of them don't want to use any that are harmful to patients. We specifically don't want them to die. No, but we do occasionally get people that we have the anaesthetist put to sleep to get the scan done if they're very, very scared. Hiya. Um, you said that uh, X-rays and gamma rays are essentially the same thing. Yeah. So what's the difference between an X-ray machine and a gamma camera? Um, so the gamma camera is only detecting um, the rays. So they, the, the radiation comes from the patient, from inside the patient. Whereas an X-ray machine is creating the rays to fire through a patient. So that's the difference between the two. Mm. More. <laughs> you need to wrap it up, Anne, or are you okay? Uh, one more? Okay, sorry everyone. <laughs> Where do you want to go? Uh, up to you. There's a few people down there. <laughs> Okay, that's it. We've got to go because it's six o'clock. Thank you all for coming.